Cool. Hi, folks. Um, yeah, so welcome to CDR. Um, Create Define Release is a platform for uh, different artists around the country to share music and build communities around music. Um, my name is Harry. Uh, I was brought here today by Saffron Records, who have curated this series of uh, artist talks. Uh, and today um, we're going to be talking with Grove, who's our special guest. Um, we spent the last hours listening to some wicked tunes. Um, and now we're going to do have a little chat about how Beth became Grove, um, your backstory as an artist, and do a deep dive into the technicalities of how they create music. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about translating that into a live show as well, and at the end we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, so yeah, without further ado, please welcome Grove. <laughs> so. Beth, if you feel comfortable, uh, if you could take a moment to describe yourself, uh, what Grove is, your sound, the vibe, uh, please. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a producer. I've been producing for about uh, eight or nine years now, uh, but I started off mainly as a vocalist doing singing, and then that's transitioned to doing like rapping and singing in this kind of weird fusion. Um, but I enjoy making music that's very direct, um, both in a sensual way and also a political way. Uh, and yeah, I've got many people to to thank for the journey uh, and the melting pot of sounds that I've, I find myself currently creating. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's been a pretty, I was reflecting on it today, it's been a pretty sizey journey full of lots of people. And I think people are a really big part of uh, any any individual's um, creation, so. Big up. Um, well, let's start then with, you know, where it all began. Um, when you were growing up, what kind of music were you around? You know, what's the musical heritage? What were your family playing? What were your friends listening to when you were younger? So my family is a big melting pot in itself. So my two older brothers were really big into kind of hip hop and early grime and stuff like that. And then there's my dad who had this mixtape in his car that had everything from like the Fugees and Wyclef to like uh, like Bruce Springsteen and th those kind of like power ballads, uh, classics. And then my my mum was <laughs> my mum was very into um, I call it divorce music, but it's <laughs> it's like Whitney Houston, those kind of like big belters. Um, and then I found myself growing up really leaning towards like sad pop music, like Lana Del Rey, um, Marina and the Diamonds, and less sad, but Lady Gaga, I was, I was a stan. Were I mean, you on I, Tumblr? I, I was on Tumblr, how could you tell? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd say that's kind of like the foundations of sound that I've had, so it's very, very broad. Uh -huh. And as like a teenager, were you involved with any particular like music scenes? Was there a local scene where you were growing up? Mm. So Cheltenham is where I grew up, and in terms of the scene there, uh, it was either like indie rock music or heavy rock music that you could get involved with. And I was in a uh, prog metal band from the age of 15 uh, till the age of 17 called The Noble Experiment. Um, <laughs> and Are we going to... Hell no! <laughs> Hell no! Um, I've seen it. Yeah, you have. You've got yeah. to see it. No. <laughs> um, but I would say, even though I find that band to be cringy now, uh, there's the saying that's like, "Don't kill the part of you that is cringe. Kill the part of you that cringes." Um, that that part that part of my life was very necessary in many ways. It's where I learned a lot of kind of stagecraft and how to perform, because uh, I was very, very shy growing up and uh, being put into this uh, situation of mosh pit starting and me being like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> like, what the fuck is that? Um, gave me some confidence in learning how to uh, direct and channel energy in different ways. What were you doing in that, in the Noble Experiment? Was it just singing? Were you playing instruments? Were you writing? I was just singing in that, singing yeah. and 
attempting to do a little bit of screamo stuff but yes. um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah yeah so just to kind of i guess step back a little bit when did you first start creating music you know was there anyone who put you onto it was it something you found yourself and like what was yeah what was the first format for you mm. the first format for me was and people in the room might be able to relate but it's like uh, the garage band app on the iphone um and i also had like a casio keyboard like the proper proper old school one um <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly um but through being able to multi-track on garage bands i would literally just put my phone right to the keyboard speaker play some drums in play some keys in layer it all up um it sounds very interesting um but it was it was a great uh mode to learn how to do something because i think i've seen in a previous um cdr talk about the importance of actually not having many resources and learning those uh, limited resources really well uh, and trying to carve uh, a sound out of that and through that through those limitations you kind of learn the intricacies of what you might want to make it might not sound exactly like how how you want it to sound because there's points where your taste level far exceeds your ability level so you know what you want something to sound like but you do not have the ability to do that yet and that's uh a beautiful thing to move through but um yeah so i started doing singing through that learning all like the little mini plugins on garage band and after doing that for a while i sent some demos to this person who ran this community studio in cheltenham and this man's man's name is malachi uh, he runs a great organization called the music works um, which gives people uh, underprivileged people a chance to get in a space and make music that isn't indie rock music or isn't like heavy rock music it's like alternative um, relative to Cheltenham and from that I was then introduced to a community and through that community and through meeting people was able to hone my craft even more <coughs> wicked yeah. big up Malachi yeah um do you have some I believe we have some clips from the mobile phone. I've got a garage band special. Yeah. Like an absolute so garage how band special. Before before we play this, how how old is it? Like how so when were you making this one on an iPhone? How many years ago? Do yeah, you so the timestamp on it is twenty fifteen. It was probably made actually maybe a year before this. Um but Oh my god. Oh god. We're so like lucky. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much of this to play, but it's proper <laughs> old. I it's 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 but it's fun. I'm like, it's, w it's still one of those things. I guess with older stuff, you're still really attached to it because you're like, oh, this is really raw and authentic. Um, but yeah, this is like a playful one during my pop era. Uh, let's just give a little spin. <laughs> Go for it. Someone said, someone said for this track, they were like, oh, did you get that sample from the Power Rangers theme tune? Because the, it goes, do, 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 um, I didn't, but yeah, that's a little flavor of like very, very early days stuff all made on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm actually like impressed though as <laughs> well. I am. You're so young. I see we've got the alias there, artist named BG. Have you had any other aliases before you became Grove? Um, no, no. no. Okay, no. well, should we talk a little bit about becoming Grove? Let's go for it. Right. When did you When did you become Grove? When How did you get into making? Well, I guess. Well, what came after the mobile phone music? Was it Grove or was there something else? Yeah. So it was Grove, and that was like, I got a band together of like a guitarist who mainly did like ska guitar, a bassist who mainly did gent heavy metal basic, and drummer Lily actually, um, who did like hardcore. And then I was playing this like. It's like beautiful piano stuff. It was very, very, very chaotic. Um, and we played like live renditions of some of my uh, garage band songs. Um, and that happened for about, for about six months. And then after that, um, I did some more kind of singer songwriter stuff and then started music production. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And was this all happening in the context of the community studios? Exactly that. Yeah. Like Malachi was linking me up with um, different like singer, songwriter, guitarists. Um, and then myself and Lily, uh, who's Diessa, we created a electronic duo group. Um, and alongside this, I was also part of a hip hop beatbox collective called Five Mics, uh, where I learned so much about um, using my voice in, in loads of different ways, in like a beatbox sense, in like a rapping sense. Um, and all of this was like the most valuable learning I think uh, I've had throughout my life. And it's and, th and the amazing thing about when you're doing valuable learning, you never know it at the time. You're just living it. You're just living it. You're not thinking like, oh, this is mm. going to be amazing. This is going to be like great foundations for this. You're just living it and doing it. And mm -hmm. yeah. Wicked. Well, do you have some clips that you could show us from Bast, perhaps? Yeah, I'll go for Bast first. And so then I've also got some five mic stuff, which... Both of these, both of these projects are very, very special to my heart. Um, roll with a bit of a bast tune first. Got a little video as well. You tell me open up my mind, see I'm already there With some abstract thoughts and an awkward stare I've heard analogies talking about a lock and key And those mouths that I hear it from really disgust me Nah, the mantra that I'm speaking, it comes from within The power of identity runs through my skin Feel like a little picture that fall out the frame Yellow from a small town, everyone know my name But when I start thinking about my youth and how I wanted to change Get a feeling in my blood, one that caused me pain See, I was mixed race androgynous To both sides anonymous With the culture of the populace Forced down my esophagus Tap into my consciousness Realise my metamorphosis This melanin is on by my mind is a contortionist Hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> oy, oy. So that was your work with Diessa. Yes. Um, and I, th I think actually, I before I knew about Grove, I saw Bast perform at like Pride, like a really before we met. In fact, um, yeah, yeah, um, really long time ago. But yeah, it was an amazing project, and I, I'm aware that actually some of your tunes from then. For example, fuck your landlord is kind of carried with you into Grove as well. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of the like the lyrics and the themes um have carried on as well. Because I think the thing about working with Lily is that um she's a very, very outspoken, very political minded person and also had that more abrasive approach to making music. Whereas before I was quite uh I was making stuff that was more palatable, I guess, in the, like sonically palatable. Um, and myself and Lily, I think the combination of Lily being in like a hardcore project and really being unafraid of that harsher, harsher sound and doing production together was like a really great union and a really great, um, uh, just added a kind of fearlessness to my production approach in terms of using more distortion and, uh, and stuff like that. Wicked. Uh, and should we get stuck into the five mic stuff? Let's get a little bit of five mic. Wicked. So this is all a cappella. Um, and so this project, there was two beatboxes, TMS and Sheps, and then two 
uh, rappers, one called JPDL, one called Grizzo, um, who are still very, very dear friends to this day. And uh, this is a little bit of flavor of that. Come on. <laughs> Feng Shui, energy, 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 energy, Feng Shui, 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 Feng Shui, energy, Feng Shui, energy, Feng Shui, energy, Feng Shui, Feng Shui, energy, 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 Feng Shui, so insightful, banging my chest, better call me primal. Hey. Cause you don't wanna know how you I roll. Now you don't wanna know how I roll. Now you don't wanna know how I roll. Now you don't wanna know, you don't wanna know. Why the baby gonna murk on the beans like get out of the way, flash, flash. I mean, no beat to the streets, just beat on the street from Cheltenham to the Gloucester City. Roaming and seeking a place to be with a bounce to the boogie without to get wavy. Far too much to if and the maybe. Such and such and I'm not a sixty straight to the head. Spin like a frisbee, buzz with the bees. Turn like I'm thirsty, round about now the right side of thirty. Plenty more time for bars about ladies. Ladies, ladies. I'm mad nervous, showing everybody in a place like a word we've lost in the music, spilling that drink, when caught to my eye line, I can't blink, too legit to quit, rave to the morning, footwork, busy flat shoes on the floor, boom, got a bang and sing with the rhythm, movement, sweet sugar, mix with cinnamon, sweat beat, dripping in a stroke like shimmering, movement, sweet sugar, mix with cinnamon, lifting the heat up, bubbling in cinnamon, movement, sweet sugar, mix with cinnamon. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So just being time conscious, because uh, yeah. soon we want to get stuck into some breakdowns of the tunes from well, the latest tunes uh, from your WP that you are in the middle of releasing. Um, we're halfway through. Um, <laughs> but I guess quickly, like, let's just fill in the gap from there to you know, the growth we know now. Um, obviously, you moved to Bristol. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to talk maybe a little bit about Bristol, uh, the infrastructure of the city, you know, what... Um, what were you contributing to and also like who did you meet along the way like the labels that you've worked with for example um who have kind of helped to kind of nourish you as an artist and you know give your work a, a bigger platform along the way um yeah i think bristol is a really unique city that has you know very fortunately like the infrastructure to bring artists like a lot higher people say you have to move to london um, and that fuck is that. not true. <laughs> fuck that. Fuck that. Um, so yeah, if you want to, you know, take some time to talk about Bristol mm -hmm. uh, and how you kind of got to where we are today. Yeah. So I moved to Bristol in, in, at the end of 2019, and I think just before I moved to Bristol, you put me on for uh, a bass show, and Snog Nights are incredibly inspiring. <laughs> Uh, incredibly inspiring because they're so like multi-genre and you can go to one night and experience so many uh, different flavors of, of sound and performance and through being exposed to that all in one night um, first of all it kind of bolsters that fearlessness I was talking about earlier uh, to kind of make sounds that don't just fit into one place sounds that um, uh, are that big melting pot and um, I was going to like lots of different nights. I was going to like the teachings in dub nights. I was going to all sorts of like um, grime nights and uh, like jam nights, open jam nights. And I think through the combination of that and going to like electronic kind of like techno uh, infused nights, I was just at the time <coughs> taking inspiration from absolutely all of it and putting it into, into tracks. And the Queer and Black EP, was just a, a total culmination of uh, all of those different influences, kind of more in a dance dance sphere. Because I hadn't really made much dance music before moving to Bristol, but I found myself very, very pulled towards um, turning the kicks up and turning the bass up and, uh, yeah, just rolling with that flavour. Um, and I think ever since then, ever since 2019, it's just been a uh, massive progression of um, increasing the melting pot and meeting new people to work with 
and doing sessions with people, which before I was very, very nervous to do stuff like sessions because it's like a very, um, you're kind of like bearing your soul right there and you've got to like be able to deal with the uh, subtle rejection of being like, oh, okay, maybe not this idea, but like moving on to a different idea. Um, but I think putting yourself on the line like that has, for me, has definitely been super, super beneficial within Bristol. Um, and I think you've kind of summed up the kind of uh, confidence that Bristol can can instill with with yeah, the energy that it has. A lot flies here, you know. A lot flies. Yeah. A lot flies. Uh, and I think as well, one of the special things about this city is people are very proud of it. You know, so if you are someone from Bristol making work and you're working hard and people like what you're doing, like they will push you. You know, that envy is quite hard to find, which I really appreciate about this place. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And yeah, I guess along your journey, I don't know if it's worth, you know, I, I feel like it's worth, you know, giving a shout out to you know, Spinny Nights, Boca Versions, absolutely. you did the Slippery EP with as well. Yep, yep. Um, really, really solid kind of people doing work and like no one's really getting much in return for it. Uh, apart from just putting a sick thing out in the world, mm -hmm. um, which is really beautiful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So before we jump into doing like a dissection of a track from the latest EP, do you want to play something from uh, Queer in Black or Spice for the, the folks here? Yeah, I'll do... Or both, I don't know. I imagine, because I've got Sticky here, but I imagine that's been heard more so, but from the Spice EP, um, I worked Incredible. with... Incredible. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, from the Spicy Bee, I worked with uh, Robin Stewart, who's one half of um, Giant Swan. Uh, and we made some... And I um, made a video with Ben Wilson and Jasmine from Jabu. Uh, and it's something I'm really proud of. Um, so I'll just show a little bit of that. And this one was on Boca versions? Yeah, this is on Boca versions. Lockdown Joker on the run with it. On the skin, slippery, feel that tide coming in. Cause you're, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, slippery, slippery. Exhale, deep diving in. Slippery, feel that soft silicon. Cause you're, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, you're slippery, slippery. hands down one of my favorite tunes ever oh. as well, say. <laughs> Thank you, <Harry. laughs> um yeah i think the first time i heard that was you asked me to push buttons for you really last minute when we were in manchester for one yes. of your shows i'd never heard it and i was like on the stage hearing it for the first time like <laughs> 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 just like freaking out um but yeah look we should jump into we should jump into power play or oh, power and soon to come play, power and soon to come play. um so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the concept, the album, you know, the process of releasing it um, before we jump into this promised dissection of, of, <laughs> of, of, of one of the tracks. Um, yeah, so with Power Play, uh, the first half of the EP, which is Power. Um, so the, con the whole concept of it is dissecting uh, power and our perception of power and how I think Sometimes when you first say power, the first thing that comes to mind is that kind of like slippery, greasy pole of trying to have some kind of power over something or exerting exerting power. Um, and that's kind of what the first half explores. It's got a tune called Big Boots, which is about um, 
the monarchy and the power that it, is, it exerts. It's also got a tune called Stinking Rich Families and uh, a tune called Dead Bird Blues. And it's kind of exploring that more janky kind of power. And um, the second half, which is coming in about two weeks now, um, is exploring uh, more interpersonal dynamics with power, like playing with power within, uh, within relationships and exploring the kind of power with the power you can have with someone, the power you can have within yourself, and the power that you choose to share. Um, and that's got a tune called Milf Magnet On, which is about <laughs> the power MILFs have within me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it's a self-release as well, which is tricky. It's like, because I've, I've been used to releasing with like independent labels and the kind of communication and relationship that you have there is really amazing in, in pushing something forward. But self-releasing, it's definitely got its perks in that you retain more of your rights, but there's a lot more um, self-work to do, which has been really good to learn the ins and outs of it before going into anything bigger. Um, but yeah, the track that I want to dissect is Milf Magnet, uh, or as it was initially called, Biddy Tiddy Bounce. <laughs> um, so <laughs> in terms of how I like to start making tunes, um, I'm a vocalist by trade, so I always enjoy uh, using vocals to kind of form the basis of an instrumental. Um, so I'll play a little bit of the track first and then explain how I, how I made the kind of lead synthesis line. Uh, here we go. Ah! Wrong place. <laughs> with me. I don't know if you feel able to multitask, but we could fill the space by talking a bit about, you know, when you made the EP as your... Yeah. So the EP, the kind of... It, <laughs> it began being made when the Queen died, and that was when... Woo! Woo! <laughs> um, thank you, Arts Council. <laughs> That was when the first in the first wave of inspiration hit for um for big boots because I think in those transitions of of power is when we can really truly analyze like wait what is actually going on here like why is this institution needed and there was all of this um, frustration that um, I was really grateful to be able to channel free music right let's see if this works um, hey okay. I am F. Milf ain't. All right. So, in terms of like the vocal forming the sample of a track, uh, it's this channel right here that goes like this. And I'll show you what that is like without any of the processing on. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> silly, silly fun. But I've got a select few um, plugins that are like my go tos. One of them is one called Shaper Box. And another one is one called Trash 2. And Shaperbox here does a lot of the work in turning it into something synthy. <laughs> and what that is doing, it's just putting a load of overdrive onto that uh, initial vocal channel. <laughs> this one's called Shaperbox 3, if anyone's interested. <laughs> but you, Within this, um, within this plugin itself, I'm just going to make a little duplicate channel. You could do all sorts of things to any sample. I'm just going to roll through some of the presets because I also love a preset as well. Like some people are very purists and they're like, "Ah, oh, presets are a bit lazy," but if they do the job, this is why we use them. Um, so I could have turned it into. <laughs> Let me get a on. It's just like an instant. 
instant good way to kind of get yourself out of the um, box so much in terms of idea creation. You just go to the mic to make any kind of random noise and then put it through this. And I found that to be super useful um, in my whole music making process. Um, and I'll just kind of give a breakdown of the rest of the plugins as well. Put a little bit of chorus on to kind of soften it a little bit. And I use Logic stock ones all the time. And that's another vocal, um, this bit here is another process in a bit of a raw vocal. So the vocal started off like this. And then through shape a box, we turn it into this. Oops. And then you just add some drums to this. Already instant fun, instant mm -hmm. fun created. Um, this is like a really useful way to like break out of the limitations of not knowing your way around a particular synth or something as well, right? Like totally. rather than having to like learn your way around FM synthesis or whatever thing you're using, like just working with your voice and throwing a few presets on it. It's an amazing like technique to share with people. And it's interesting how this kind of links in a little bit with your background with the beatboxing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. uh, I've got some like loads of beats as well where I will just start with beatboxing something in and then putting that through some like software plugins. And it just, because I guess what the aim is to always eliminate the time between having an idea and turning that idea into something. And you can kind of lose your, um, lose your steam when you're trying to be like, oh, but I can't make this snare sound like this. Oh, da, 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 da. Um, and I'm sure lots of people here maybe use voice notes to kind of capture ideas as well. You can literally just get the voice notes, put it in the projects and just fuck with it. Um, yes. And in terms of drum making as well, uh, alongside this process, um, finding the right kick drum could often be quite the struggle. But there's this really great uh, plugin called Kick2. And I love, love, love Kick2 because, again, you've got like a load of different presets and through all of these uh, different really uh, visceral and kind of um, easy to visualize uh, different parameters, you can make a kick drum sound from anything like... Actually, I'll just mess with this one. Uh, Or you can just start changing it. <laughs> but yeah. Let's put you back. Oh. Oh, that's even beefier. Man, I should have used that one. <laughs> Right. Be in the most of dedication for the rest of your life. Angela Bassett, Halle Berry, Jennifer Coolidge. Ra Jeez, <laughs> we find an instant upgrades. Um, <laughs> um, but also, uh, one of my favorite bits about this track as well is the kind of silky, sexy 808, which is. Oop. Hello? which has disappeared. Wait, let me see if I just... Oh no, it's just gone. It's just, wait, let me just reload the project one sec. <laughs> but there's this plugin uh, called Sublab, which I find to be... Uh, if you're looking for like 808s that are instantly punchy without having to drop samples in and trying to and try and uh, warp the sound to um, 
to fit to the kind of baseline that you want. Because within Logic, it might be different in Ableton, but I'm very Logic. When you try and like uh, change, transpose the sound, it can have like artifacts and stuff like this. Um, but with Sublab, it's just instant, silky, sexy, gnarly. Okay, let's give you a go. Hey. This one's been a little bit difficult for a sec. Um, how the fuck do I do it? Ah. But I'm sure a lot of you already know, just adding like a little bit of a glide. Um, just like in this corner, just adding a little bit of a glide as opposed to bit together. And all of this is just like, this is probably the one of the most minimal tracks that I've made because usually I'm like a channel fiend and I'm adding, I mean, to some this already might look like I'm a bit of a channel fiend, but usually sometimes it can get up to like crazy amounts, like, like 120, uh, different things, but just keeping it nice and simple with um with a few select plugins. Personally, I really like manually putting in all of the different uh, different like kicks and hits and stuff like that, or playing them in through MIDI. Um, and if you use Logic as well. A really good uh, way of getting quick and good sounds is using the, the drum synth. Mm. Is using the drum synth that comes with it. So if you just like click this here, go to drum synth. Um, there's some really wicked presets. Getting some like really nice sharp hi hats. And what I use a lot as well is use the arpeggiator instead of having to like repeatedly click, you know, whenever you want to hit, hit a hi-hat or something like that, just using the arpeggiator. And you can add like all sorts of swing in that as well. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um, yeah, so in terms of like the instrumental, I never know how in depth to go with this kind of stuff, but in those those form kind of the basis of that. Um, and in terms of vocals, I'm like an absolute fiend for, uh, I'm an absolute fiend for like vocal mixing and vocal processing. Um, but again, just using a combination of kind of like shaper box of chorus and really subtle stuff. Um, that could be a whole thing in, in and of itself, but. That's a little bit of like of milf magnet. Uh, I yeah, I think I think in terms of like a speed rundown of milf magnet, that's that's like I'm quite fun to share. I'm really impressed by how beefy but quick that was. Yeah, that was yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how many vocal channels have you got there? Oh, channel for coolish forty six to quite a lot. Quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And is it always like that? Is uh, so are these like copied? Are they different takes? Like, no. So I do lots of um, left and right uh, mm -hmm. panning with the backing vocals. Mm -hmm. uh, and the actually, like kind of lead vocals. How many channels would you usu usually have on them? Oh, I would aim to keep the lead vocals. Like the verse would be one channel, and then the hook would be a different channel, um, unless there was some really specific processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the bridge would be a different channel. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is um, having so much fun with backing vocals yeah. and get so lost in that whole world. I'll just go give it a little rundown. I want to be a milf magnet. Milf magnet. Aye. Milf 
Love Mag... Love Mag Nerds. Oh, and EJ is on some backing vocals as well. Um, Love Mag Nerds. Which gives like really nice different textural bits as well. I want to be a MILF magnet. I want to be a MILF magnet. I want to be a... M is for mystique, don't know what she thinking. I guess for intelligence, hope you and I are sinking. We'll have to release the acapella version soon, you know. She's winking. F is for with fingers interlinking. Mature is a taste, not to savor the flavor. I got a proposition, so come be my savior. Like my ignition, bring wild thing behavior. Flip me quick like a Motorola razor. Yeah, so I've also got a big thing about like queering up dance hall music. Um, I'm kind of making it as scandalous as possible in a gay way because um, as a lot of us probably already know there's like rampant homophobia and kind of uh, old school dance hall uh, dance hall rhythms and dance hall tunes so I think it's like like a little mini side quest of mine to really make it gay as hell um, <laughs> so yeah uh, speaking of gay as hell, we could move on to uh, a quick breakdown of your boyfriend's work. Absolutely, yeah. let's yeah, do it. Good. That's a, that's some segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess it's also uh, worth mentioning, like um, all of this stuff does get translated into a pretty like wicked live show with like i've seen various kind of forms but now always with ej mm -hmm. um who was singing on uh backing vocals on the last track i don't know if you want to like talk a little bit about working with ej while we wait for this to load yeah absolutely um so me and ej started doing the live show together oh yeah two years ago now and ella as well as being an artist in her own right, an incredible artist at that. Um, very, very lucky to have her uh, bring in her wide knowledge of synthesis and synthesizers to really complement to complement the tracks. And not only that, but also to be a solid like when you're a touring musician, um, your mind space is very, very sacred, sacred thing, and. Ella is incredible in bringing balance to not only the musical side of it, but the emotional side of it. And um, also on Power Play, features on it twice, bringing, uh, I think what's interesting about us is that we, br we, we bring two very different energies. I'm kind of like a very hyper kind of ADHD kind of like, Ugh. I mean, EJ's uh, very grounded, beautiful presence within the music. Um, so within Big Boots, uh, the ending section is just this like chaos breakdown with this like s serenity woven into it somehow. And then in the second half play, uh, Ella features on another track and it's just gorgeous. We go into the kind of like trip poppy realm um, and it's really, really, really fun. Um, yeah. Oh, and in terms of what I do, I've, I've got like a, um, for live shows, I've got like a MIDI controller and I map um, I map some MIDI controls to Ableton Live. Now, I don't have a clue how Ableton works, but I know how to bust something to another thing. So I just like get some mad delays up, some mad reverbs, and just absolutely fuck with them. While the majority of the backing track plays from a from CDJs, which I have no shame about. I used to have shame about because I was like, ah, oh, the electronic music community is going to think I'm a fraud. But if something sounds good, and you can do it well, that's that's the main thing. I feel like you guys are doing enough on stage already. It's, yeah. it's okay <laughs> to have a CDJ in there. Um, so this is your boyfriend's work. So okay. this is an old one. This is an old one. And I have so much fun chopping up samples as well within this. And I'll just go from the kind of first drop bit.
in the dark, palms pressed to our eyes. Can't stop thinking about the girl. No, I can't stop thinking, thinking. Sitting in the dark, palms pressed to our eyes. Can't stop thinking about the girl. Connection starts with that eye contact. Give a little, don't wanna take it back. Pour a little saucy, how it reacts. Never done this before, cause your boyfriend's work. And that's a lay. Wait. <laughs> um, so one of my, this is one of my favorite chops I think I've ever, ever, ever done. And when starting a track, um, sometimes I've, I, I, I start it with um, there being a, a specific person to collaborate with in mind. And there was this illegal date night like three years ago where Swan Meat was playing. And I'd never heard of her before. She, she makes this like, bonkers, like really bonkers electronic music. And I was incredibly inspired by her. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a tune that Swan Meat will wanna collab with me on. And I was like, right, I'm gonna chop up something and it's gonna be really cool and it's gonna be really alluring. Um, <laughs> so th this is the thing. And I'm going to strip this back to what the sound actually is. And I'll just kind of zoom in to the kind of weird chops that are happening as well. <laughs> very unglamorous. Um, it was literally just like speeding up some saxophone samples, slowing some down, looping some over, as you can kind of see in the, um, with the actual sample waveforms. And then I'll kind of just go a little bit step by step, start with a little EQ. <laughs> And then, <laughs> this is Logic stock pedal board option, um, using a preset, just rolling with that. And then I love using tremolo, like a really hard panned uh, tremolo, which is what gives it that really nice staccato. <laughs> called the Beffy Special. <laughs> but with this, it's basically just, um, with tremolo, it, it usually goes from like side to side. If you turn the phase to zero instead of uh, 180, it just means that it's just, just pure chops. Um, just pure chops, man. <laughs> and I just add a little bit of distortion to that. I don't even know what this dude's doing. It's not even doing anything. Then we'll add the other layers bit by bit. So we've got a little hollow kick. And we've got some crazy percussions. Dark, I think this is probably a good point to focus on those vocals, those kind of like nice form and shifted um, weirdness. And for that, I actually don't use this plugin so much anymore, but it's a plugin called Nectar 3. And with this, you can, you can create your own vocal chain all within this one plugin. So it makes the whole side bit a bit less messy. Um, and what did I do here? Sitting in the dark, palms pressed to our eyes. Can't stop thinking about the girl. No, I can't stop thinking, thinking. Sitting in the dark, palms pressed to our eyes. Can't stop thinking about the girl. Connection starts with the eye contact. Give a little, don't want to take it back. 
Pour a little sauce, see how it reacts. Never done this before, cause your boyfriend's whack. Um, that actually changed midway through. But um, using form and shifting on the voice, uh, I think is super fun. Nectar 3 is the plugin. Um, Are there any other plugins you use for form and shifting now? Yes, so now I use um, Little Alter Boy. Yes. Yes, which is, uh, I found that I actually found Little Alter Boy through, um, there's an artist called Sev Deliza who I really, really love. And her producer called Mucky, he does these uh, Twitch live streams where he just gives whole breakdowns on her tracks. And there's this track that she does called Oh My God. And there's this like middle breakdown, which is ooh, so gorgeous. And the combination of like automation and form and shifting um, uh, is a beautiful thing, which I've yet to explore with the automation element of it. But uh, yeah, that's how I kind of discovered that kind of thing. Wicked. Yeah. Well, thank you for breaking those down. Um, we're quite limited on time now. And Our I time should goes quick. Yeah, it goes quick. But we should probably open it up to a little bit of audience Q&A. Um, just before I do that, is there any kind of last bits you feel like, any last nuggets of wisdom you feel like you need to, you want to share? Just get it wrong. Like, get whatever you're doing. Just, like, don't be scared of getting it wrong. Because I think I've, sp I've spent, like, years just uh, getting it... I mean, wrong's the wrong word, but, like, getting it off. And... Um, being unafraid to kind of share those off moments as well is super useful because there are so many people who are uh, who get who like get the energy of what you're doing, and if you let that kind of fear hold you back from putting yourself out in the world, um, you you just might limit yourself. Uh, so. Step into your fearlessness. I think that is what I'm trying to say. Having like sinew in sessions, like one thing I've noticed is you will like just move on really quickly to the next thing. You'll you'll lay something down and you're not going to spend a long time being like, no, I need to make sure this snare or whatever sounds perfect right now. It's like just get all the ideas out, and then mm. I feel like you kind of have more of a habit of going back later. Would you say that's sometimes been okay? Sometimes. When I've seen you work, <laughs> this is what I've seen, and I, yeah. I was like, I can see how you can get so much done. Uh, working in that way, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think that's but that's maybe. that's a that's a good side. But okay. <laughs> well, we should open up to the audience now. Oh, um, I got one more bit. Oh yeah, my mum always told me to be bold. Like whatever you're doing, be bold. And I think that really summarizes what I was trying to say just before. Just like, just fucking do it. Like you, just fucking do it. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of being bold, if anyone wants to ask any <laughs> questions, um, there's a wireless mic somewhere in the room. So just wait till you've had the mic till you ask so that the, obviously this is being recorded so the people listening later on YouTube and that can hear it. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, like raise your hand and I'll, yeah. Yes. Uh, when it comes to the like the early stages of the creative process when you're starting with your ideation and you're like iterating ideas and just laying things down do you have any particular routines that you fall back on uh, to stop yourself from like losing that momentum i do whether i use them or not for myself the whole time is a different thing um but Often I find, and I imagine maybe with the kind of music that I know that you make, it's like a similar thing. Uh, but starting with like a sample, um, starting with like a sample that stretches for eight bars and kind of just creating whatever complements that sample to begin with, um, I find that to be incredibly driving because that way you're working towards some form of a concept instead of just like, right, I'm plucking ideas out of thin air, I need to like make this work. Um, I mean, whether you keep that sample in or not is a different thing, but like starting with a, with a concept of any kind um, is where I always make my, my favorite things. Um, but yeah, and, and if something's being a bit slow, going to what I know in terms of using my voice, putting it through, I've got like a vocal pedal board that I also use to kind of get, um, to kind of jam with myself because Sometimes I can find, oh, I'm just like trying to make a beat. And when you're trying to make a beat, your head is 
restricted into beat mode. Whereas if you kind of like take it out of that and are able to kind of jam with yourself, it's a lot more, lot more freeing, I find. Thank you. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It, yeah, Half. actually it does, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a second small one, which is how precious are you with the stuff that you put down? Not precious. I try and bounce in place as much as I can to make myself not precious. Um, and I'm not not precious enough. Some people are like very bold and if they don't like something, they're just like, delete. I'm like, everything I don't like, I'll just put it at the bottom and then see if I can work it in later. Like I'm a, like a little bit of like a hoarder in that sense. But if something isn't working, just mute it out onto the next bit. There's another question behind. Um, do you have any advice on how to step into your fearlessness? Mm. So that's a big, that's a big, big question. <laughs> and I think it starts with, um, it's like without like music aside, it's questioning who am I surrounded by? What fuels me to get on with the day? and uh, what energizes me and how can I do more of that and how can I see more of those people? Because once you step into your self, that way you can then step into your fearless, fear, fearlessness by showing those good people close to you, hey, this is what I've been thinking of making, this is what I've been thinking of doing. Um, and it's, instead of having a a mindset which I very much do where I want to protect myself from like criticism that's like scary and all of this just uh, stepping into a place where you can take criticism in your stride and uh, but also realize what what kind of criticism is right criticism and what kind of criticism you're like oh, actually no like I like this like I know I like this um, and I don't care what anyone else thinks I'm going to stick with that kind of thing. So it all starts with, before music, people, foundations, what you're feeding yourself, both um, physically and kind of more spiritually, I guess. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, you next, yeah. Um, you said you'd learned a lot from uh, like self-releasing. Um, compared to like being on a label, what are some of the main takeaways from, from doing that compared to releasing through a label? You've got to be organised. You've got to be very organised and disciplined um, because there's nothing to fall back on. There's no one to, you know, I've got, I've got a manager, so I've got little reminders of like, oh, okay, you need to, you know, get together some form of socials plan. You've got to um, be hitting this at, like hitting this kind of promo at this time you've got to be getting your masters in at this time um but yeah organization discipline and focus and kind of like research as well um yeah may i'm mainly thinking about like promo stuff because that's very at the forefront of my mind right now and it's a ball ache Okay, thanks. Um, I'm really interested in how you go from this into your live performance. And one thing in particular I was reflecting on, I went to a gig recently and wicked, but really clear that all of the vocals was on the track to the point where it was a mime. So I'm like, how do you make, because your performance collectively is really energetic and really well balanced. How do you make that decision between your vocals, what's on track and what isn't? Oh yeah, what like I would say probably ninety nine percent of the live stuff I don't put any lead vocals in. Um, me and Els will sometimes decide what backing vocals we'll put in the track or what backing vocals Ella will cover. Um, but yeah, I think for me it's like a general rule of thumb. Like I never want any lead vocals in because I've been to a show like you've been, um, and I've been like, oh my gosh, I'm so gassed. I'm like never gonna, you know. It's the first time ever seeing this person. I've been listening to their music for years. And when they're like miming along to it, it's, I guess to each their own, people have different confidence levels in their live ability. Um, 
but I think once you take away, it's like having a, having a bike with stabilizers on. You just got to take those stabilizers off and see what happens. Um, and it means you, I guess, you work t work towards being a better uh, live performer when you don't have the stabilizers. Um, so that's what I try and do as often as possible. And if I can be really cheeky and sneak one more in, um, in the future you're going to have like this really chunky tour budget. You know, you can like bring loads of band members on you. What are you prioritizing in terms of your instruments that are being played live? That's a great question and it's been something that's been at the forefront of our minds a lot. Because um, we love doing the CDJ based stuff, but it, it means that there's not much room for uh, jamming or anything like that. And I think a priority of ours is going to be, uh, I think, having a live drummer or percussionist of some kind. Um, I'm going to learn some more electronics. I've got some amazing samplers that I really want to learn in depth and have the space and time to do that, which after November, after this um, run of headline, t uh, of headline shows in November, told the agent, like, we're having six months off to totally take a step back and rework everything. And a really great example of that is Young Fathers. Like, I saw them at Glastonbury, and the way in which they've expanded their live set to be um, kind of, yeah, more more kind of backing track based to s this show, this performance, this, uh, they've got like backing singers, they've got the whole uh, shebang that's like dynamic and beautiful and risky. Uh, that's what I'm excited to do, like add more risk into the live shows because I think that's what makes live music exciting, the risk of everything potentially falling apart. Uh, but you know, people holding it together because they're talented and very good at what they do. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I mean, we're, we're over time, so I think that concludes. Um, want to say thank you so much, Grove, for joining us. It's been absolutely incredible to have you share all of your wonderful knowledge and you know some of your incredible journey so far with music and we're really excited to see what more's to come mm -hmm. um and also thank you saffron for curating this thank you to cdr for organizing it thank you arts council for funding maybe we've